Okay. <clears throat> We're ready? Are we ever ready? <laughs> Good afternoon. My name's Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we are going to be looking at the art of Vasily Kandinsky. Now, this is actually our second of two episodes. Just a few days ago, we recreated Color Study, Squares with Concentric Circles from 1913. And this was a, a very important painting in the history of Kandinsky's development. But we use this painting as uh, for our beginner artists in order just to practice some very basic color mixing. The composition is really pretty straightforward and very simple so that anyone, including children, uh, people who are, I, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> anyone can paint, make this painting, I guess, including children. Um, so we all, so we've kind of been introduced a little bit to Vasily Kandinsky and seen a little bit about his art. We're going to kind of dive in maybe a little bit deeper today because today's episode is going to be a little bit a uh, little bit more involved. So this painting is might be for more intermediate or advanced painters. Certainly if you're a beginner painter, you can see every step that I do from beginning to end and you can do your best to try to follow along if you like. There's nothing super outrageously difficult. There's probably a lot of concepts and processes that maybe you're seeing probably for the very, very first time, right? So we will, you know, in, in future episodes, kind of break down some of the things that we're gonna be doing today individually so that it might not seem so overwhelming for someone who who's literally just beginning and and as this might be their very first painting that they've ever made besides the color studies that we did um in our first five episodes so again i, I just want to make clear there i don't want anybody to feel super overwhelmed and this is not you know required but it is uh, you know I, th I didn't want, I, one of the reasons why I chose today's painting is I didn't want people to think that abstract art is really easy and it's, and therefore we're just going to do a bunch of abstract paintings for beginner artists and then we'll move to more complicated things like faces and landscapes and stuff because abstract art can also be very difficult to paint as well. You know, because the old saying goes, oh, my kid could do that, is what, you know, abstract painters have heard for over a hundred years now. And I think as we'll see today, if your child can paint this painting, as I always say, I mean, sign them up and uh, start buying them some art supplies because you have a golden goose on your hands and you might as well milk it. I say that as a father, which is ridiculous. But anyway, um... So let's get right started on this painting. I'm going to take a quick sip of tea. Before doing anything strenuous, one must always have tea. So I'll let you know, this is the process through which we're going to approach today's painting. We're going to start with our image transfer, and then we're going to apply a first coat of paint, which is the Imprimatura. While that's drawing, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Vasily Kandinsky's biography. We're going to sort of pick up maybe a little bit more of where we left off last week and talk a little bit more about the latter part of his career. And then we're going to start painting this painting. Now, some of the, the steps in here might be a little bit different than what we would normally approach because in an abstract painting like this, we don't really necessarily have traditional foreground background relationships, which is a real I mean, that's a deliberate aspect, especially especially with Vasily Kandinsky. So we'll kind of, it might not be quite as straightforward as what we see here. Uh, but at the very, very end, you'll see the side-by-side -side comparison. And if you're watching this video for the very first time, you could certainly skip right to that part. Check it out, see if you like how it turned out. And if you like how it turned out, you can come back and join us right back here again. 
Okay, so just as a quick little uh, mention here, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, uh, commenting on videos, especially after the, the live viewing has already aired, is a great way to let other people know um, that this is something that they can also do themselves. And then if you feel today's episode was helpful, you can certainly contribute a small or gigantic donation, you know, as little as a dollar, as much as a billion dollars, whatever feels comfortable for you out there. Okay, so let's talk about the image transfer. How are we gonna transfer an image onto a canvas or draw the image onto the canvas? Now, I've tried to simplify life for you by creating outlines that are free and you can download, but you don't have to give me your email or anything. It's free for anyone on the planet. And you'll see that if you click, there's a link, I think it's a second link in the description below to the Dropbox folder, you will see uh, there's a whole bunch of, of folders within this main folder and you can see there's like a hundred and I don't know 30 40 paintings uh, Just as I mentioned at the very top of the folder. These are all our very basic paintings Right and all our introductory classes right up here. Here's where we had yesterday's painting and I know it might sound confusing. If anyone's got a, a more intelligent way of organizing things, I am all ears. But where are we? We are at 113 here. And you click in here, you'll see these three files. You will see the original painting and then a tracing, which I did using the Procreate app on my iPad Pro, just going over top of it with a, the uh, pencil. And that gets us a really nice, very simplified outline. Obviously, you just print out the original and then you can trace from there, but this sort of might, you know, simplify things, especially if you don't want to use up a bunch of the colored ink on your printer, right? So you can print it out. I have an inkjet printer here at home, just a cheap one from the uh, local Best Buy, and you can print it out, and then I'm going to show you how to transfer it onto the canvas right now. So I'm going to enlarge this full screen. And I'll talk over it while it's playing. So you'll see that I'm going to use a 9 by 12 sized canvas board. You can buy these canvas boards at your local dollar store. I bought mine off of Amazon and I've been using the same brand. This is not ex actually the, the same one that I've been using. I'm not so happy with it, so I'm not going to tell you which brand it is. The ones I recommend are in the description below. Um, and so you can see I just tape it down. I'm not really, for this painting, too worried about getting it centered. You see I'm using carbon tracing paper or carbon transfer paper. I've used graphite transfer or, or tracing paper or, uh, before, and they work the same. Um, now you're going to see, I'm not sure what happened here. I must have been pressing really hard when I did these lines, and I'm going to use a ruler to help do a few of these lines. I'm just using a red colored pencil. That way at least I can see which lines I have already drawn. Otherwise, you know, a picture like this can get kind of confusing. I will, going forward, be using a pen. At some point here I, I start using a pen just because the pencils keep breaking and I actually get a much thinner line because you're going to see here when I peel this off, because this, this takes, you know, maybe I don't know, 10 minutes or so for me to do all of this. There's a lot of little details. And this is a case where I think doing some of all these little shapes is helpful. Oops, you can see there you go. Um, often I ignore them. There are a few places here where I didn't draw every single line. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happened, but that's the result that we get. Um, so this is, it's interesting because, you know, uh, usually when I do these outlines, they look a little bit more like this. They're a little bit thinner and a little bit more faded. Whereas whatever happened, they got a little bit, I got carried away. I must have been quite uh, angry or something when I did this just a few days ago, because to get them to be that dark, you have to have a fairly wide um, tool. Maybe the pencil was really dull and I must've been pressing really hard, but um anyway i'm gonna i save my uh 
the, the outlines, the templates, because you never know, maybe I want to use it again in the future. <gasps> okay. So, the next step here is to apply the imprimatura, right? And the imprimatura is the first coat of paint. This is a traditional approach that artists have been using for five, six hundred years now. It means, in Italian, the first coat of paint. And there's lots of different ways that we can approach today's painting. The way that I'm going to do this is the way that I've done almost every painting over the past 187 paintings, which is to apply my warm yellow, diluted with a little bit of water onto the surface. Um, you're certainly welcome to use any color that you like to, to do this process. Traditionally, artists would use a, a kind of a rusty red, a kind of a brown to do this. I think though for our painting, you know, as I, I, I think this is gonna work out quite nicely. Um, we do, there is this kind of a bit of a yellow quality in underneath, or maybe it's not necessarily underneath actually. I think it's might be over top of things. Uh, very thin little glazes, which I think we'll do anyway. But uh, it's just sort of always kind of nice looking closely at an artwork because all the answers are right here, right? Whatever we want to see or we want, you know, it's kind of, we're kind of being a little detective. If we look at it, we can kind of deduce a little bit about how it was created. So anyway, I'm just going to continue doing what I normally do, except maybe not put quite as much water in there and I'm gonna stir this up the reason why I put a little bit of water in there is I'm just gonna thin it out and make it dry much faster you could use matte medium and you could potentially also use Mod Podge although Mod Podge as I've said before is not really you know, it's not intended, I don't think, to be like a quality artist uh, material, although I think it could work. And so I don't know how, what its archival qualities are, whether it's gonna just fall up yellow really quickly over time. Although we've got yellow right here. But uh, anyway, let's so. The other reason I'm gonna put this down here is it's also gonna help prevent the pencil marks from doing too much smudging which they're already doing a little bit of when you press as hard as I did on the on the transfer paper you're going to get more pigment from that carbon paper coming off onto the surface and that will likely um, result in sort of a little buildup on the surface here so it's you know I can see it it's just ever so slightly smudging and I even darkening this yellow a little bit as I brush onto it so I just want to try to do this get this over as quickly as possible to reduce that as much smudging as possible so I'm just trying to even out some of the these lines on there in fact I need to just dry that brush off a bit I think also, maybe before I go too much further, I am going to blow dry this and I'm going to put a coat of white, uh, a thin white coat over top of it, which is going to do two things. It's going to get us closer to the original. It's also going to kind of mute some of these really, really dark lines that I have on here. Um, because these are just intended to be my guidelines. At the moment, they're almost as dark as the, the, the lines themselves that I ultimately want to paint on here, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, I could keep these lines like that uh, and if I really wanted to. 
I don't really want to, so I'm gonna try to get rid of them a little bit. Um, so I'll show you how I do that. So um, I'm actually gonna blow dry this really quickly just to help seal that in. If I can find my blow dry, there it is. So you'll forgive me if I just mute the audio for um, 30 seconds. Okay, it might still be a little bit wet along the edges, but that's okay. So the next step is I'm just going to add some white here. Yeah, let's do this here. Is that enough? I'm not sure. I put a little bit to the side. And, you know, now I'm just looking at the color. This color is almost a, a little bit of a, of a brownish gray. I know there's some blues and greens and pinks and purples and stuff over here. But uh, in the, the main color that we see on this background is like a just ever so slightly um, darker color. So you know what, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix a dark color and then I'm gonna just put a tiny bit of it. Oof. So these paint tubes are starting to get kind of clogged up. What I got all these little bits on the top and then they prevent the, the tubes from closing properly. And then it's sort of a spiral effect. They just keep getting worse and worse. So every once in a while you gotta go through here and just pick off all of these things. And actually I've started to save all those little things which makes me sound kind of nutty but I've I've started I've you can use them for different parts of your painting if you want to build up texture right you just mix that right in to the paint okay come on there we go and it just sort of thickens up the the, the painting um, okay move this out of the way and there is black in this painting uh, I think though for the black in this painting I will use a Posca pen for this right because we can see there's some black in here I can I'm gonna mix my own black for that but all these little lines I'm gonna do with a acrylic paint pen rather than painting it with my paintbrush just because of how time consuming that would be and drawing lines with a paintbrush can be done there are some artists that are great at it i don't count myself as, as one of them so i'm not uh you know at some point you decide is it worth me spending like you know four times the amount of time on it no okay so i'm gonna take my white all right let's let's take let's mix our dark color as uh, getting all distracted here so my dark uh, color i'm gonna mix a black right we've talked about how to do this before i should take a little bit more so i'm taking my warm red and my cool blue mixing them together and we get this super muted purple 
and then I'm going to add some cool yellow to it and that cool yellow added to this mixture completely kills it off and it just becomes a gray a really 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 dark gray not quite black but it certainly comes pretty close to black okay so I'm just gonna wipe that off and we'll put that in there wow lots of people in the chat here tonight it's just filled full there's Donna and Sandra and Tanya and Kathy. Kathy says, it's great to be part of this painting group. Thank you for being part of this group, Kathy. That's great to have more and more people here. There's Carol and Dolores and Pascal. Well, we got the whole crew together here. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so what I'm, let's make our this white that I want to put on here. So to do that, I'm going to first just get all of this white on my brush. And I think that's enough. We can always do this again. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put ma uh, matte medium in here. Rather than putting water, because if I put water in this and try to paint that over this yellow canvas, it's entirely possible that I'm going to start actually scrubbing some of this yellow off, right? So I actually, if you know, I, I could get away with it if I'm very quick, right? If I do these, if I paint over top of this with white with water in it to dilute it. If I do it really quick, I could I could get away with it. But if I start doing what I did to get this yellow and kind of just night trying to make it nice and clean and I'm going to start scrubbing the yellow off, which could very quickly dissolve into like a panicky, frustrating kind of experience. It's the last kind of experience that I want when I'm painting. So instead, what I'm going to use is matte medium. Matte medium is just acrylic paint that has no color in it. It's just transparent, which makes it a little bit tricky when we're mixing it into white because how do you know what's the medium and how do you know what's white? I totally get it. It's a little bit confusing. Um, but... The good thing with this is this is going to make it this white more transparent. That's the whole reason why you'd maybe use water or whatever. Because I don't want to completely obliterate the yellow I just put down. It would sort of defeat the purpose of putting that yellow down to begin with. Um, and by diluting it, now I can put several layers on here and get to the exact color I want. So I'm going to take a bit of this darker color... That was, that was way too much, Michael. Ay, ay, ay. So now i got a much darker gray. See that? Look how quickly that was just like a small amount of color. So there's a few different ways now I can approach this. One of which I'm going to add a little bit of white. Now, to, to do this, I would really have to add a lot more white. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to add a little bit of white. You'll see when I mix this, it lightens up a little bit. Not too much, but probably good enough. We'll see. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, even more matte medium. It's just going to make it a little bit more transparent. Okay, I want to make sure this is mixed in thoroughly because you don't want to have one part that's, you know, super thick and then we got a big uh, area of white in the middle. We want it to be as well mixed as possible. You know, it's just like making cookie dough or something. You probably don't want to have one bite that is just a big block of butter in the middle of a cookie, although that kind of sounds could be delicious but or a big bite that's got a whole bunch of sugar or salt or something in or, you know like one bite's full of chocolate chips and the rest don't have any 
Okay, so let's take this mixture, and again, the the matte medium is gonna dry. You know, it, it it's it'll dry. It it dries about the same speed as water, but the thing is, is it it will it behaves a little bit differently in that it it sort of gets a little tackier, whereas water just it doesn't get that tacky. So you, again, you want to be relatively quick when you do this. Right, and there's probably some people like, whoa, we just lost all the, the, the whole image just disappeared. It's still there. I mean, I can still see it. I want to get all of this paint on as quickly as possible. And I'm glad I made extra now because I'm just barely going to have enough. Okay. And then as I kind of spread this out, it's gonna get a little bit thinner. I'm not too worried about making it perfect either, or I'm never worried about making it too perfect, but. realized our daughter's baby monitor's audio is still on there. <sighs> so I have maybe another 10 seconds before of this. I can already see it starting to get kind of tacky. So, this, I've got maybe another th three or four seconds of this. You can see it's getting a little bit thinner. Okay, it's, I think, yeah, I can start seeing these sort of like wavy shapes happening. So, I gotta wrap this up here. Okay, so again, you could, I don't know if you can see, those lines are there, right? And it, I'm happy that they're, that everything's sort of diluted a little bit. I don't know why I just did that. I should have just waited. Okay, so what I'm going <laughs> to, you see, I just get impatient, and it's good for people just to see what happens when you get impatient, because if you start doing that, then you actually start pulling paint off. I don't... I don't know how many decades I've been doing this where sometimes it just, you, you never learn. Okay, I wanna blow dry this because I think I am gonna add a little bit more white into these corners, I think. Potentially after I blow dry, the blow drying is also going to make the, the as the matte medium dries, it's gonna be, become more clear, right? Because in the jar, it looks white once it dries it goes clear so as this dries it's going to get more clear so maybe before i promise i'm going to do a second little bit of coating let's just see what it looks like first
Okay. So, you could... Well, I don't, I'm not sure if you can... The lines are all there. And actually, now that it's dried a bit more, I think I'm going to leave it. Even though there's there are these sort of patchy areas around the edges where it's it definitely is much lighter and really that's an effect of the brush hitting the edge of the you know let's say this edge here and it kind of it's kind of scraping the paint off of the edges and pushing it towards the middle that's why I'm always sort of going as many different directions to try to spread it out so it's not unusual that the edges are a little bit thinner than the center um but I think the, 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 I am going to do other colors over top of this. And it's going to get a little bit darker anyway. And I always, I, I, I like that warm yellow coming through. So I think I'm just going to let it be. <laughs> I saw uh, Sandra says, I'm trying to start the tracing now. Um, so there's so many lines. I'm already behind. I hope he talks about Kandinsky's life for a while. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. I appreciate that. And Pascal, uh, ever so helpful, says, Well, it doesn't have to be perfectly precise, Sandra. You can trace after two and bring the printed tracing next to it and remove, bring it back, rem remove as you paint. Oh, and there's Ravi there. And Paula... Oh, everyone's here. Paula, uh, or Ace in the chat is Paula in the Facebook group, just for those of you that... Um, okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's kind of transition here for a moment and, and help Sandra catch up. So the next thing that I want to do is talk about Kandinsky, who he was. Um, I do see Carol says, could transparent white work the same? Um, and there's hi from Rachel, says Rachel. <laughs> uh, tra could transparent white work? Um, I'm not sure what that is. I mean, there, there is, you might have something called, I think one of these is called, yeah, maybe, maybe this is what you're thinking about, transparent mixing white. Transparent mixing white, there's a future episode where I'm going to talk about all the different kinds of white. Uh, transparent mixing white is definitely less opaque than uh, titanium white, but I don't, for this type of a thing, if you were to just paint it on its own right out of the tube, I think you basically, you might, you'll, you'll probably just obliterate the yellow entirely, and your pencil marks as well. It, it, this is, it's not really, this is, using transparent mixing white is a, is a pretty, is a, definitely a more advanced art material. That's why one one of the things you know that you should just notice when you're when you're buying the paint is the sizes of the tubes of paint. All of the colors that I am using come in large sizes, and even Amsterdam uh, Royal Talons, the 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 brand that that owns Amsterdam Paint. They've just started making these giant gallons of the, of paint, and it's interesting that they're also using the colors that I'm using. And that should always just be a little bit of a hint. Oh, those are the colors of the split primary palette, right? Whereas things like transparent mixing white and zinc white, which are the exact same thing, just the way different brands call them they don't come in those large sizes because there are very specific uh, tools that are rarely used by artists. Right? We're going to talk about that in the future. The reason why I haven't talked about it thus far is because 
it's it's it is definitely a more advanced concept and i always just want to try to keep things as simple as possible to avoid confusing people but to help clarify up any confusion we'll talk about it in the future okay good good questions i love all these questions um ed says michael are you using acrylics how would you start with oil paint which with which kandinsky worked with Yes, Ed, we're using acrylic paints. All of these paintings are done with acrylic paints. Um, how would I start with an oil paint? You could do a very similar activity with oil paint. In fact, you could do all of what we're doing with acrylic paint and then paint over top of it with oil paint, right? You can, as, as long as your acrylic paint is dry, you can paint oil paint over top of it. The rule doesn't work the other way. If you, if you paint oil paint down, you cannot use acrylic over top of it, right? Uh, most most canvases have acrylic gesso and you can still paint oil paint on top of it. Oil paint will stick to acrylic surfaces. O acrylic will not stick to oil surfaces. How would, so you could do the same thing that I've just done with acrylic paint if you have it. You could also do this activity uh, if I was to use oil paint to do this, you could do like a oil, um, like an oil wash. Like you could use, um, uh, like you could put your your paint on, and then some. Like a, what I used to do is 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 paint, and then uh, like you mix it in and make it really thin. Like basically, you're staining it using uh, odorless mineral stir. Odorless Mineral Spirits, OMS, or otherwise, which is a substitute for turpentine. And you put it on, and then some artists will just sort of maybe even scrub a little bit back with a rag to make it a little bit thinner if you want. Um, anyway, it's an acrylics class, so I'm going to focus on acrylic. But, um, so, again, <laughs> let's talk about who Kandinsky is, or was. And who he still is, his, his, his work has, has long lived after him. But maybe just worth mentioning here at the top uh, to join the Facebook group and post your artwork to the Facebook group. Once a month I go through everything on here and I give people feedback on the art they're making, including the paintings that we're doing in class, as well as the paintings you're making outside of the class. If there's portraits of your family and friends, landscapes, abstract paintings that you're working on, and you want to share them and celebrate them, let's do that. If you can't figure out what's you know, not working about it, let me help you with that. It's free. Most people find it some of the most useful stuff on this course. So let's just kind of look in uh, Vasily Kandinsky's bio again. So born 1866, dies in 1944, right before the end of World War I or World War II. Born in uh, Moscow and grows up his his youth in Ukraine, Odessa, Ukraine. We talked a lot about that last time, so maybe I'm just going to skip down. Um, uh, I don't know. I haven't read the, the Wikipedia thing here. I've just been doing my own reading elsewhere, but... Um, it, so okay so it looks like okay so one of the the foundational moments of Kandinsky's life and you can extend this out into art in general because of the impact Kandinsky had in terms of art history is that Kandinsky sees a, a show of impressionist paintings in 1895 um, I think in Munich and he sees Claude Monet's haystacks right Claude Monet was the the most famous of the impressionist painters in fact impressionism is named after one of his paintings impression sunrise which we also painted about two years ago i think um and so kandinsky saw haystacks by monet now monet did dozens and dozens of paintings of haystacks we are going to make but we're going to paint one of Monet's haystack paintings. I don't know if it's the same one that Kandinsky saw that blew Kandinsky's mind, but I think a lot of them are, they're not all the same. Some of them are very, very different, including the one we're going to paint is, looks very different to, than this one. But essentially what happens is Kandinsky sees that painting and 
In fact, let's just open this up since how since it's so important. Um, let's see if we can find some of these images. Like Kandinsky sees these paintings, and the reason why it it is so. Uh, I think he describes it as like being surprised and confused is because the the way that Monet is using color is is almost independent of form in that Monet starts to, his paintings might feature haystacks or churches and landscapes and water lilies but at some point it all they're almost what it is of becomes kind of irrelevant or at least that's the way Kandinsky sees it he see he's he's like it, really what these paintings are about is color they're not about haystacks they're about a celebration of color and what color can do and so Kandinsky starts thinking to himself like what if we liberated color from its its need or its, or the way that it's been used to help describe other things in in the in the in the cause of creating illusions on canvas and paper right what if what if color didn't have to do that what if it wasn't just a means to another end but it was its own end right if what if we just made a painting that was literally just color and the wheels start racing in his mind and he gets, starts getting really excited and he can't stop thinking about this idea so much so that he has he's a trained law lawyer he's gone to law school and now he's a law professor teaching law at university and he's thinking about these haystacks he's thinking about coloring and he can't get it out of his mind so he quits his job he he applies to art school he doesn't get in but he keeps painting he's now obsessed with this idea and eventually he gets back into art school he did go to art school previous to this when he was much younger before going to law school but he obviously couldn't get rid of that bug of art that some was i know what that's like when it gets a hold of you so he kandinsky just starts like i think here you know he talks about um, like he saw the haystacks, I could not recognize it. The non-recognition was painful to me. I considered that the painter Claude Monet had no right to paint so indistinctly, right? Because you know impressionism, right? It's kind of this impression of things, famously kind of um, fuzzy kind of stuff, right? I duly felt that the object of the painting was missing, that the haystacks were evaporating. And I only noticed, and I noticed with surprise and confusion that the picture not only gripped me, but impressed itself eradicably on my memory. Painting took on a fairy tale power and splendor. Right? Oh, I mean, Kandinsky, for, in, in many ways, is remembered more for his writing and his a text he wrote called On the Spirituality in Art, or in the Spiritual Concern. Concerning the spiritual and art, I totally boggled the name of that. Concerning the spiritual and art from 1910, although I think because it was written in in Russian, I think I've I've seen it translated differently. So maybe I'm not so nutty, um, but it just goes to show kind of how evocative his language is when he's writing. Um, so the other main thing that I think is really important to think about with Kandinsky is the influence of music in terms of his thinking, right? It talks about here him being interested in Wagner's music. And, and Kandinsky starts to, to think about how what music is. Music is inherently abstract, right? Music, it's not like you can make a... a, a, a a, a sound on the violin that someone goes oh that's an apple that's an a that's what an apple sounds like or you play another do 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 and somebody goes oh that is matte medium that's what that's matte medium sound right or blah 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 blah, blah. oh that's a, a a lukewarm tea right music is is separated from language in that way right it's more emotional and up until this point, visual art was the exact 
opposite of that. Music was all, or art, visual art was all about describing exactly, well, we could argue about this, but describing, trying to represent reality, representational painting, right? You may want to make a painting of a mug that looks like a mug, and if you had all bunch of mugs on the shelf, you could look and find the painting, go, oh, that's this mug, right? You can be one to one, right? And so color is being used to create the illusion of other things. What if, what if color and lines and shape didn't have to, to make pictures of mugs and faces and stuff, but do, but evoke emotions just like music did? Mind explosion, right? People never really thought, I mean, maybe people thought about this, but no one really thought about putting it all together in quite the same way that Kandinsky did. Now, I just, I, there's probably a few people going, yeah, but what about Hilma Af Klint? We did talk, we did two episodes on Hilma Af Klint. Uh, these are some of the very, very first painting episodes I ever did. So if anyone is like, you know, this, there's a big elephant in the room we haven't talked about. In all due respect to Hilma Afklund, she is the big elephant in the room, right? She is generally considered to be the very first person to make an abstract painting, right? So we can, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of her work, and she was long forgotten in terms of art history and is now finally getting her due. And if you haven't watched the Hilma Afklund episode, I'd certainly encourage you to go back and watch that one. That was from a long time ago. So I just, that's, I think it's important to mention her role in abstract painting is she's the grandmother of all of modern art, one could argue. Anyway, so let's just talk about what do I want to get to really quickly. Um, so that text that Kandinsky wrote, uh, the, the concerning the spiritual in art, immediately starts spreading like wildfire all over the world is translated into various different languages very quickly it becomes very very uh important like in the english world particularly it spreads really quickly around england and the united states if you're an artist alive at this point in time right around world war one you have read this text by kandinsky you might not even be familiar with his paintings you may have never seen any of his paintings but you have read his text because or at least all of your friends that you you go to the pub and have absence with um and moonshine with or whatever it is that you're drinking they have read it and they're all talking about it because it is it's the the foundational text about abstract painting whether people agreed with it or not, people could argue about it. But anyway, let's, uh, I want to, let's just, uh, where did we leave off last time when we were, so we looked at Kandinsky's, the first, you know, couple decades of his paintings from after he finished art school, after then went to law school and then went back to art school. And then this is where we ended up last week, looking at all this work where he's become by this time now, he's almost entirely into the abstract realm here, where all these paintings, you can see again, a few little landscapes pop back in here. But by the end of the of World War I and the communist revolution, Kandinsky is full on abstract painter. And that's where we're, we get to when we see this painting, right? And so he's painting these images that no longer have faces, or at least not intentionally have faces, they're abs, they're not only abstract, because as a real quick thing, basically everything is abstract, right? Even a photograph is an abstraction of reality. It's not really real. It's, you know, a computer code in your phone that is reproducing reality but it's not, it's still an abstraction pulled from reality, right? So so you start with the real world, whatever that is, because that's a whole other thing artists have been arguing about. But we start with the real world, and then when we make a, even if we're trying to make a painting that looks exactly like a painting, it's an abstraction of reality, right? 
if if I'm trying to make a painting in my face, am I gonna actually paint every single little pore on my face? Can I have a conversation with that face that I've painted? No, right? So it's an abstraction. So the more and more we get abstract, at some point, the, the whatever it was based on falls away and you're no longer even abstract, you're non-representational, right? Because they're no longer representing anything, which is where we get to with Kandinsky. So we have these non-representational paintings, or another ter term you might hear is non-objective. Uh, and th these are, uh, I mean, I think they're really wild and cool and strange and weird. Here's today's painting here. Kind of often, you know, he did a number of these around the same time, and they're all kind of numbered like this. Because, like music, Kandinsky starts thinking of his paintings as like musical notations, right? That literally someone could read the paintings or in, enjoy, like, somewhat, like, a, in the way that a composer or a musician can look at sheet music. And go like oh da 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 blah blah blah, right? No, I can I know how that would be on guitar. A a, a a viewer could look at Kandinsky's paintings and have a similar sort of experience. Now, what that experience actually is is up for debate. Um, there's Kandinsky wrote some things that suggest that he had synesthesia, which is the ability to hear colors and see sounds, etc. Uh, I've been doing a bunch of reading about this. The, there's people who've written PhDs and books about this, and most people who've done a lot of research say that that's pr probably not the case, that he didn't actually have uh, synesthesia in its actual clinical sense, but that he was thinking, like he was trying to visualize sound in music, for instance. Um, okay, I don't want to, I, I want to get to the painting here really quickly, but you can see I get excited about some of these things. I just want to show that, to, you know, so this period of time, he's living, and when he's making the, today's painting, he's living in Munich, Germany. Because uh, he's kind of gone back and forth. He's done a lot of traveling around that area. And, you know, after World War I, there's, there is sort of a sense uh, that things have kind of... Were, okay, thank goodness all of that chaos is over with. Let's get back to normal. He's living in... Um, he's been invited by the Bauhaus School of Art and Design to become one of it, you know, to to take some classes there as well as kind of tutor and and the uh, the Bauhaus is probably more famous now as like an architecture and design institution but there was obviously artists like Kandinsky that that uh, were in that environment and what should happen at the end of the 1920s and the early 30s we have the Great Depression the rise of uh, uh, the Nazi party in Germany and there's this constant harassment of the Bauhaus movement and school which is forced to close and move all around Germany and Kandinsky at 57 of his artworks are confiscated by the Nazis I think in 1933 and Kandinsky is just like you know what I'm out of here and he boots it he goes to, to Paris as well as a lot of artists you know um leave Germany during that time leading up to World War II and Kandinsky spends the the remaining I guess it would be 11 years of his life in Paris where he eventually passes away um, but you could see you know there's this interest in geometric pers uh, geometric abstraction and then towards kind of the mid 30s now this is now he's living in Paris he starts getting interested in what is known as biomorphic uh, abstraction which is a much more organic type of um, painting where we see rather than the kind of hard geometric lines of the of the painting we're about to work on here everything starts to get you know they look like organisms underneath a microscope kind of thing that's often how they've been described and, and a number of other artists including uh, Paul Klee 
uh, or um, we've done a few paintings by artists like this. Uh, Jean Arp. Um, uh, Juan Miro. We did a, a Miro painting a year ago. Similar sort of approach to painting, right? Okay, so I think this is, he's, he is a, certainly an incredible artist, um, and uh, let's get right to it. So, often at this point, what we might do is what we would call like the underpainting, or the under, well, the lines we've put on here are, would probably be considered the underdrawing. The underpainting is often any kind of line work that an artist might paint in order to help with the, the painting process, right? So if at this moment you felt like your lines were too light, you can't see anything, this might be an opportunity for a bit of the under painting, right? If we were doing a portrait, one thing that someone might do is actually just paint some of the facial features either in or back in, depending on what happened to the underdrawing itself. But I don't think we're gonna do that. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna move to the, we're gonna continue working on this background a little bit. I wanna now start customizing some of the colors that we see in the painting itself. So in the painting now, you know, we've got this, you know, on the surface right now, kind of this grayish white over top of everything. It's a little bit patchy, which is actually not entirely off of what we want here. But this is an opportunity for us to now start maybe putting a little bit of the color that we see in here. We could do this at a later stage, but I certainly wanna do it before I put any of these black lines on. Because if I put these black lines on and then I paint you know, some of these very thin colors over top, well, then I'm gonna have to put those lines back in later. So I'm gonna do that right now. And I can, I could probably even use a little bit of this color that we made previously, but just customizing it a little bit. So I think I'm gonna do that. Which brush should I use? Let's go down in size a little bit. I'm gonna take my cool yellow. I'm gonna just mix it right in this mixture. If, you're, if you don't have any of this left over, that's okay. We can just mix it again. Um, let's put it just a tad bit more white. And I'm also just going to put a little bit more of my matte medium in here. Maybe I'm gonna put a little bit more. It's always easier to, to err on the side of caution when you're doing this kind of thing in terms of just not putting too much. Make, like if I make it thinner, more transparent, then I can do lots of layers until I get to the exact layer opacity that I want. If I go too opaque too quickly, then you know there's, there's no way back from that, right? So this is interesting. This is a little bit of a grayish yellow. I'm not sure this is exactly what I want. Maybe having that gray there. I don't know. I'm gonna keep a rag nearby in case I just wanna wipe some stuff off. So let's just see. Ah, uh, you know what? That's actually okay. I'm okay with this. I just have to try to maybe be careful about getting um, too much on, especially where there's some lines, because I don't want to lose my background uh, here, so. So I think I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna wipe a bit of this off, and then I'm just gonna sort of do this as a bit of a dry brush. So dry brush is sort of like what it sounds like, right? Where we're painting with a brush that is kind of dry. And even a little bit of this left over, I can just sort of, ver I mean, I, this is probably barely even visible on camera here, right? But 
but that's maybe kind of the point. We want to keep this to be very thin. Um, maybe just a little bit more of this. So if I'm just looking at the painting, actually let's put them side by side. to boot back up again so that's it's taking its time it just looks like there's a little obviously there's some blues and oranges down here it's not really yellow it's a bit more of the, the previous color that was there So I think that might be good. Maybe what I'm going to try doing is just taking a bit of the previous color that was there. Here, here. Um, I'm just taking my gray that I had. And I'm just going to paint this into the bottom. Just let that be, I think, I think. Well, I have to think about it, you know, <laughs> like, um, maybe. Oh, that's good, okay. There are a ton of questions in here. My apologies. Whoa. Um... Sandra got the outline finish. That's cool. Uh, uh, the question is about heavy body paint. So I'm using heavy body acrylics. I, that's what I use for all of the paintings that we're doing. Heavy body acrylics is thicker. Uh, you, there's, you have heavy body, and then you have soft body, and then you've got uh, acrylic ink, and then uh, fluid acrylics. Heavy body is your thickest paint. It's, it's the, um, but we can, we could still use it for making any of these paintings, right? Tony says, definitely no need for impasto tonight. Um, okay. So, what should we do next? Uh, let's do the, the pinks and blues. Maybe we'll do the blue next here. Let's clean this brush off. So what this so right here this is a, a cool blue or it's actually all it's a, it looks like there's actually a few two different blues in here. We have got this looks kind of warmer and that looks cooler and this is a cool green. I think I think what he's done here is maybe I mean if you really want to do this exactly as he's done we could paint a warm a very very thin warm blue and then over top of it apply a, a, th a thin coat of cool blue I mean that gets pretty um, we're starting to split some hairs there um, but <laughs> let's <laughs> Why not, right? So I think though, at this point, rather than using uh, 
uh, my matte medium. I'm going to use some glazing fluid just to make things glazing fluid is is more well suited to this type of exercise than than um, matte medium just that it, because it dries just a little bit slower in fact let's go for a smaller brush here uh, so I'm gonna take this is my my um, ultramarine blue my warm blue and here's some of the glazing fluid. You could still use matte medium for this. I don't want to say you shouldn't use it or don't use it. This is just, this is really more along the lines of what this was actually made for. Um, glazing fluid has a little bit of a, a material in it that slows the drying time down. So that's, it. it's ideal for doing any kind of thing like this because that way if I'm not happy with things, I can really just wipe it away quite quickly, depending on how thickly I apply it. So, oops, I want this to zoom in. <laughs> so you can't really see too much. It's pretty faint. But um, I think up here... I mean, this is very transparent, obviously, right? In fact, I'm going to add a little bit more blue to my mixture. The, the other thing, too, is once you paint with it, you just kind of have to deal with it and let it dry before you do too much more. So the great thing with this material is I can kind of just keep on painting and blending it out until I get to kind of closer to what I want. It's a lot more forgiving than the matte medium would be. So I can also just take another brush that might be, that should be dry. We can just kind of soften this blend out. Now, I know that this probably just seems really ridiculous, like doing for some people, like just doing little squares and circles on a page or canvas as opposed to painting faces and hands and trees just seems strange, right? But this is kind of a window into what the art world was like a hundred and plus years ago. As it dries, it starts to kind of, um, it doesn't behave all that well, right? So you got, again, you have a kind of limited amount of time where you can fidget and play with things. So I guess I can do a little bit of coloring of a few other little spots in here. Let's just zoom back out. Where where else do I want blue to go? 
The other blues are a little bit, are colder blues. So maybe I'll just leave that at that. And instead, now I'm going to take my cold blue from over here. And I'm going to put more glazing fluid in here. Now we can see that's going to be much darker. So maybe put a bit even more. And I'm probably also going to upgrade to a bit of a larger brush here momentarily. But I'm going to, before I do any more, I'm going to blow dry this so that it locks in. Otherwise, if I try to paint another layer of glaze over top of this, it's going to be very, it's just going to um, wipe off whatever I've done here. And it'll, it'll, there'll be a lot of swearing involved. <laughs> so let's just blow dry. So I see a few comments there by Ravi and Donna about uh, losing the pencil lines, right? If by, you know, the initial layer of, of uh, or that white that we put on kind of obliterated much of the image, which is totally, you know, it ha happened a little bit to me where I lost a little bit of the shapes. You know, again, that's, that's why you want to err a little bit more on the side of caution when you're doing any sort of transparency, a coat, like that because otherwise if you go too far then you're gonna you know block out the colors that were there and the the lines that were there right if if in doubt make it thinner and then just do a second coat right um, because otherwise you know again once you've gone too far it's hard to kind of pull back uh, you, you can't really so um, let's now, I'm going to take this cool blue and I'm going to paint it around. Whatever you're doing when you're using this kind of thing, you want to, you know, quite quickly, you know, think about kind of softening your edges. You don't want to do too many large areas without kind of coming in and blending it in. Otherwise, you'll get some kind of much more rigid lines. You know, I probably could go, you know, I, I could have this be um, uh, more concentrated, cool blue. But again, you just saw the conversation we just had about having colors being a little bit too opaque, that white. 
So there's nothing wrong with just taking your time and going a little bit slow, go with the speed that feels comfortable to you. One of the things that we can use are all of the, the black lines that are in here, right? The, this painting is gonna look a little bit flimsy for a while until those black lines get in there. So you just have to sort of trust that if you're getting the colors in the right place, when those black lines come, they'll instantly lay all sorts of order on there. Right, the black lines is like the cavalry that'll come in and save the day right at the end, right? The deus ex machina, right? Just when you think the there's no hope, boom, here they come. Da -da 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 Now I could just paint a lot of this blue and then I could glaze very lightly with a white over top of it too, right? There's just so many different ways that we can approach this painting. It's just really how much subtlety do you want to be able to get in your painting? All right, so I'm going to take a bit of a bigger brush here. All right, I'm going to soften. Oops. Just make sure that brush is kind of dry before you try to blend it out. Okay. Let me see. Anything... How we do that same thing into the bottom left corner here? I'm going to take a bunch more glazing fluid. Actually, I'm going to wipe some of that off too much. All right, again, get this nice and dry as possible. Okay, so let's just take a look. And let's see them side by side like that. So I think I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this dry. I can blow dry that and do another layer. So, you know, I, I, I totally... I can get why some people just are like, yeah, pff, this is not my kind of painting. I, I, I personally think, you know, at the very least, we're, we're, we're practicing glazing. And we're practicing glazing on something that's not a face, right? Which might be liberating for some people, right? Because some people, if they're trying to learn how to glaze and you it's not quite even on a face like the leonardo we painted last week it can be kind of discouraging 
here, if the glazing is maybe not totally even, you're like, yeah, you know what? It's abstract. Hey, no one really knows what it's supposed to look like, right? So you may find that more liberating. I'm going to blow dry this and then I'm going to go back over it again. Okay, so I'm just going to continue doing this. I want to really darken this area here. Just gonna do the same thing down here. that line when I actually paint that with my pen I might widen it because right now it's kind of curving ultimately I'd like for it to be quite straight so that's something we'll talk about there because that's that kind of stuff happens all the times but and we're also this painting is much smaller than the original as they always are but um, okay Let's, what else should we, let's move on from the blue. I think that's, I mean, ideally it'd be nice to get that just a little bit darker. So let's do that. We'll do, I'm going to blow dry this and I think I'm going to go for just these two areas, get them even more saturated and then I'm going to move on from that.
Okay. So I, I often will look at the painting from the side to see if this matte glazing fluid has dried. That's why I like using the matte or satin glazing fluid because it's not shiny. And beca when it, because it's not shiny, when it's uh, drying or when it's dry, it's not shiny. It's, it's shiny when I'm painting with it, but then the shininess, the gloss disappears versus when you're using glossy mediums sometimes it's hard to tell is it just is it glossy because it's glossy or is it still wet okay likewise oh that's good I'm gonna take a little bit more of my my uh, cool blue again. This time I'm gonna do. There's a little blue circle over here, so I want to get that. I don't. I'm not gonna go for quite as as transparent of a color. I do want one that's a little bit transparent, but. I'm just going to go to a smaller brush here to do that. Now, I'm by painting this I'm also kind of losing a little bit of the shape of the the circle that was here so it's gonna it would make it really difficult to it'll make it difficult to, to do the circle perfectly I'll just have to kind of take it for granted that the way that I painted this now is about as close to that circle as as I can get Do a little quick tour around the painting where else could we put this blue that's a warm blue we'll paint that in separately um, there's a warm blue there but there's the same cool blue up here now I, you don't have to worry about putting all of these in the correct places right if our painting changes a little bit I am not going to try to do all of the lines exactly that as they are in this painting. That doesn't really concern me. That doesn't seem like too much fun for me. So you'll have to forgive me that I'm going to take a few shortcuts here and there as I work on the painting. Um, he probably painted, worked on this for a long period of time. I want to try to do this painting from beginning to end in about three hours. <laughs> just like we've done with the Mona Lisa and, and every other painting. You know, there's, uh, most of you are, are probably just happy to get something that kind of looks right rather than, than be able to, to stand in for the real thing, you know, so that you can sneak into the museum, put this one on the walls, and then walk out with the real one underneath your arm. <laughs> right? Let's do, I think, uh, let's, let's do a little bit of warm blue. Again, I'm going to take a bit of, uh, we could have done this maybe a little bit earlier, but I do find the warm blue tends to be a little bit transparent on its own anyway, but it is also quite dark 
on its own. So this is just going to lighten it up by making it more transparent. It'll appear lighter because it's going to be more transparent. So where were the blue shapes? Um, in fact, let's go to a smaller brush again. interesting this this blue now that I'm painting it I think it is a bit more of a, um, a colder Prussian blue so I think I'll let that dry and I'll come back and Paint a second layer over top of it, which will just sort of get rid of the sort of the brush marks that I see in there currently. Um, let's go right up top here. Somewhere in here, I've got a, bl a blue circle, so I'm just going to put this right here. Maybe not in the exact right place. Which I know puts me on the radar of the paint police, but... You know... I've been on their radar for a long time. And yet, I'm still a free man, so... I'm not, not sure why I haven't been arrested yet for crimes against painting, but... Um, uh, it, it might happen any day now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna. Do I want to just maybe I'm just gonna blow dry those real quick and then we'll, we'll take care of that. There we are. So let's just do this a second time. So I'm not on camera. That one wasn't quite dry. I don't think this one was quite dry either. So I'm kind of pulling some of that paint off, which is a bit of a bummer, but that's okay. I just was getting impatient, so I'll wait for that to dry and let's move on to a different part. Let's do the purple and then the red. Let's take the time to wash these brushes. Even this brush, which I was using as a blending brush, I'm gonna wash that because if there was paint on there, that which there was, I was using it to blend, that is gonna start to dry up. And then the painting, it's gonna have like uh, frosted tips. <laughs> right? And that will eventually ruin the brush, right? So anytime the paint comes in contact with your paintbrush, with acrylic paint, you know, it's gonna start drying within minutes, so. The sooner you take care of it, the longer those brushes will last. So let's make a purple here. Let me take my oops, uh, 
cold red, my magenta, and I'm gonna mix it with my warm blue. And I think I'm just gonna speed things up with this idea of trying to glaze and get really, really thin layers like this. I think, I think we can sort of get the point. If you really want, I might do, the, <laughs> speaking of which, I will do that down here now that I look at it, but for like an area up here, This is fine right out of the tube. Now I'm going to paint all of this black over top of it. My main goal is just to make sure that this shape is circular. Looks pretty good. Yeah, just leave it. Okay, any more purples? Okay, there's a little purple circle down here. Let's go to the smaller. This is, looks a little bit darker because I'm painting, the paint is going on thicker than it did previously. So anytime you have larger, um, thicker areas of paint, it's usually going to be darker, or at least it's going to be more opaque. And if the color is dark, it's going to appear to be darker because less of the lighter color, the canvas, gets through to our eye. I think that's okay. Uh, let's come back to this area right around this shape here. So to do that, um, what should we do? Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm gonna wipe this paint off the brush. I'm not gonna clean it, cause I'm gonna use it here in a moment. I'm gonna put some glazing fluid on my palette here. So this is some glazing fluid in my paintbrush. Which still has some purple in it because I didn't wash it, I just wiped the excess off. Now that might be enough, but just in the interest of just cutting a few corners, this might make it a little bit darker, maybe darker than I want, but I also just want to be able to move on relatively quickly here and hopefully get this done in one coat. So we'll see. We'll see how well I've mixed here. So I'm going to try to just get this uh, purple area right around here. I'm quickly going to paint all the way around. And then I'm going to use a another, uh, this one's a dry brush. super super happy with that it's not quite as maybe dark as I want so but I don't want to do it touch it again I'm just gonna let it sit and I'm gonna do it again all right because that's you know with this glazing fluid you just you can't you, you do it once and then you let it dry do it again which is why you could see why it would take something like the Mona Lisa which is done in oil paint which already takes a long time to dry so long, right? When you're doing glazes, glazes, glazes. If you're using acrylic paint, we can just blow dry it, boom, do the next layer right away.
Okay, so I just, I noticed it was still a little bit wet, so I just want to make sure it's, it was wet before I moved on. Let's just do this again. I got, where's my blending brush? Okay, I was about to, I got to blow dry. I, every, every time I try to do that, I, it blows up in my face. So let's blow dry one more time. getting there not quite as perfect maybe as I would like it to be but I'm do one I'm sort of touch it up one more time here Okay, that's good enough. Um, I just, see, it's a little bit bigger than what he did there, but that's okay. Um, and I think that's all the purple in this painting. Let's go on to, oh, let's finish this purple that was right in there. Should have been a little bit lighter that little little one, but that's okay. 
So let's now, uh, let's build out the, the warm red radiating area. Let's take our bit of warm red and glazing fluid. We'll do this all over again. I just realized I had a bit too much uh, red on my brush. So I just wiped it off. I didn't clean my brush, but... Actually, it might be helpful for me to quickly glazing fluid Subtle. We can do this a bunch of times until we get to the, the the opacity we want. Okay, so let's blow dry that. Interesting, just looking at the original here, it looks like he's actually used a bit of a different process to do this. He's got, um, it's a lot rougher around the edges, the way that he's painting it, which is tells me he's probably painting it uh, kind of like the we did with the Agnes Pelton painting a long time ago. If you remember that, that was about a year ago we did that painting. And we used, rather than a blending method, we use just very careful um, shifts of color to, to slowly radiate outwards and in, in each into little brush strokes. Okay, let's blow dry that again. This time, I'm going to go for a little bit more of a more opaque, not quite bright red, but just slowly kind of getting more pigment in here.
already getting kind of dry on the brush. Even more red. Okay, I think that's good for right now. Um, you know, it's not exactly like the way he did it, but I think I'm, I'm okay with, with it being slightly different and having a bit of a, well, maybe I'll just get rid of a bit of the harder edge, just soften that up just a little bit. It's a little bit late for that, but that's okay. I can live with it. Um, so, I'm gonna come here. Now this is actually a cool red. Hmm. So let's get our magenta out to do that triangular area. Let's take um, glazing fluid and just a little bit of magenta. Like you see when you add, you know, like the magenta goes pink very quickly when it's made more transparent over a white surface. It looks like we add white to it, right? It gets much more of a pinky color. So. Again, that's probably a little, I mean, it's a little bit more opaque, a little bit darker than the original, but uh, I won't tell if you don't tell, all right? You, you, if anybody asks, just say it's, that's, you know, that's sort of the way it looked and maybe I'll survive to paint tomorrow.
whenever I think of like the the paint police, it reminds me of the Leonard Cohen song Jazz Police. The Jazz Police are watching. I don't that's I don't remember how the song goes. Dun da 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 <laughs> Pascal crack me up with those little emojis in the chat there Gonna do all that perfectly. That's pretty good, right? There's all sorts of little tiny squares, and maybe I'll do just a few in here. I'll just kind of. Hint at it. You know, as Pascal pointed out in the chat there, this the original painting is massive. It's about the size of a giant sheet of plywood, right? You know, 89 inches by, um, by, I don't know what, I don't know where that went, but it, you know, 50, 55 by 79 inches, which is, you know, 79 inches is basically about as wide as I can stretch my hands, you know, 55, you know, like, so it's all of these little things there's a lot of little details that you know probably you know what would be one thing let's say you know this purple circle which right now is about just a little bit bigger than my thumbnail that would be about that big you know the size of the bottom of a paint can in real life so if you're like wow he must have been incredible to get these amount of details in it yeah well if the painting was five times the size <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Lolly's there, and great to see Lolly. Looks like a black hole, says Paula, a purple. Pascal says, I think the, je the art police will arrest me soon, but more seriously, it's really cool to better understand colors, less improv. I better know how to mix, what to mix to get what I want. It's nice. That's the that's isn't that great that feeling of being able to have at least a, the beginnings of some control over all of your colors and your palette and getting a little bit closer to being able to paint what you see in your imagination or what you see in a photograph. You know, I, again, I I just think the way that painting has been taught, the way I learned how to paint is just, is so confusing. I... So, that's why I think, you know, I, I'm biased because this is my, uh, my approach that has been cobbled together from a bunch of different things, but I think it makes things a lot easier for, especially for a beginner painter. Ah, Sanders says, Michael, do you think you could talk about the composition choices for this abstract pieces? Or for this, um, the, the, why did Kandinsky organize this painting the way he did? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and I don't, it's, it's 
gosh, you know, it's really hard to say, like, um, you know, he talked about, or he wrote extensively about, you know, how these are kind of like musical notations that like a viewer could play, just like a composer could read a musical score and then perform it. I, I, what does that actually mean, right? It's not like we have a shared um, language for what triangles mean or blue circles mean. Even though he tried to kind of formulate something like that, I mean, he would make, he, he, he saw very, like he would say, you know, a triangular, a yellow triangle, um, you know, is, uh, is, more pointy than a blue triangle. And the pointiness of that triangle will communicate different things to us than, you know, like, than a softer triangle, you know, and that one might then feel differently about different things. Um, so I, I don't know how, like, rational the, the composition is. Like, there's certain abstract painters, like Jackson Pollock, where it's just like, there's this, ex you know, it's abstract expressionism. A expressionism is like the, the raw feelings pouring out, right? And Kandinsky was probably more aligned with expressionism than he was with constructivism, which you were hearing a lot of isms, you're like, Pfft. constructivism is another Russian art movement by another... By um, Kazimir Malevich, who uh, is this another painter famous for painting the black square <laughs> on a white canvas. Uh, but constructivism was much more like very rational approach to painting. You know, so what was what was he thinking? Like, did did he when he was putting lines and squares here did he feel like it was really important that this pink triangular shape had to be right there and that if it was over here it was saying something totally different in the same way that you know we can garble up you know if you're you're speaking it learning a new language and you get one word inverted in the wrong place in a sentence you go from complimenting someone to insulting someone I don't I don't know if if he was thinking of it in quite those terms. It's it's really interesting to try to think what he was thinking about, but I I think I mean this is I for a, there was a period of time where I tried to do fully abstract paintings. I was just really I'm like how does what is the thought process behind all this? I really wanted to understand. And after a while, it made me really anxious because it felt like I was just swimming into the unknown. There was nothing to hold on to. And I think that's why a lot of abstract painters, they, they kind of create rules for themselves as to like what the boundaries are between what they can do and what they can't do because at least it gives them some structure. Because after a while, you just feel like, I don't know what, like I'm... I, I feel a little bit lost in my mind, right? Um, so, needless to say, I did. I, I spent about six, seven months trying to investigate uh, abstract painting before I kind of came back into abstraction versus abstract or non-representational painting. Uh, let's. So I want to get this green down here. Now that's a real muddy green. So. Uh, let's take let's let's make a, a warm green actually that's not bad I was gonna make this much dark actually that's gonna be Where can I if mix this? Maybe it wants to be a bit more brown.
I remember I had a I had a painting teacher when I was in graduate school who said uh, I rem um, I was I was him and I got into like a argument about Matisse and so before our next meeting I went off and I was reading a bunch of stuff on Matisse and I thought came into our meeting really prepared to kind of um, you know meet him head to head about some ideas differing ideas that we have about painting and he was just like basically just dismissed what I had to say because he's like you know what artists artists have no idea what they're actually doing they're the worst source for information on you know so if you're reading Matisse's Matisse wasn't doing what he, th he thought he was doing <laughs> um, which is I think was a convenient way for him just to avoid dealing with anything that I was trying to talk about Um, just to dismiss my my whole train of thought entirely, but that's a whole other question. Thing. Needless to say, we did not see eye to eye on many things. Um, but it is interesting to think that, like, you know, if an artist can can write about something, then why? What's the purpose of painting it, right? I, somebody made another quote about something very similar to that. Like, if I could explain it, I then I wouldn't need to paint it. Um, okay, I feel like I'm slowing down here. I want to kind of speed up, so... Let's, um... Let me get a little bit of brown in here. So I've got my warm red, warm yellow, and warm blue to make a brown. I'm not too worried about like little fuzzy edges in my painting as I'm painting it because when those black lines come in I can kind of just sort of cover up the edges between colors and all of a sudden it will look much cleaner and more organized and than it might at this moment. <laughs> thanks Sandra for the donation through the super chat thanks for always addressing my hard questions <laughs> I, I mean it's always fun to get questions like that because sometimes there are things I haven't really thought about or I'm thinking about but I forget to talk about and so on uh, I'm just going to take my warm yellow and paint it in a few places here and then I'm gonna get my cool yellow out and paint in
One thing I do think a lot about, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of art from the turn of the last century. The, what we often have, you know, the avant-garde period of painting, you know, cubism, futurism, um, because there's a definite sense at that time that there's a lot of possibility for art that we've just sort of scratched the surface and we could change the world as artists and artists were deeply involved in a lot of like uh you know the politics of the of the early 20th mid 20th century the interwar years and then i think there was after afterwards um, a lot of artists became very disillusioned and felt like maybe maybe art doesn't can't do anything you know maybe maybe uh, you know our job is just to paint pretty pictures and which is kind of pretty it's kind of sad kind of feeling so I, I guess I kind of I'm more attracted to the idea and hopeful idea that that art can kind of change the world if and um, and so that maybe that's why I'm just more aligned with with those types of artists. Okay, so I'm taking some. Uh, uh, glazing fluid in my cool yellow. Maybe I'm just going to put a bit more of it on there just to speed up this process and get a little bit more of vibrant effects. Now there's going to be a red circle in here. I've kind of lost it. So I'm just going to kind of paint this whole area. Just keep on going here. Okay, that might be good. So I'm going to start doing my black outlines here in just a few moments. I think I'm almost at that point. 
point here. Now there are lots of other little colors, but I think I'll at some point like it just gets a little bit too confusing to try to do it all without being able to see any of them. So uh, where should I put this red here? Let me see. Look around and see if I got something small that I can use as a tiny circle. And I have a compass around here somewhere, but uh, who knows where it walked off to. I guess I'll just draw it in. Let me just see. So tech, let me see if I can kind of build a little bit back. If I have that line. Okay. So I'm going to take my, uh, do I have any white on here? <laughs> no. Okay. So let's get a bit of white. So we'll just speed this process up with a little bit of white. We'll have a, a more solid color upon which to paint brighter red here momentarily. there's all this these areas of with white you know what? I think I'm gonna use a bit of glazing fluid get a bit of white on here again it's a little tricky when we're glazing with white It's always kind of hard to know how opaque that is when you're mixing white into a glazing fluid that appears white but is actually transparent. So, again, just like we, that whole, we talked about this all the way back at the beginning when we put our kind of white, grayish white layer on it first. I like this just slightly more white than the background, right? The background again was a little bit dirtier and that just helps kind of make things pop a bit. I 
Ah, how did I get some water on here? Okay, well, we'll just take a little bit of time just to wipe things away. All right, if you, if you see a quote-unquote mistake, and you can take care of it pretty quickly. It's when that mistake sits there for hours and you don't even realize it's there that gets you in trouble. Okay. So, I might actually paint a little bit of black after all. I was gonna mix that together. Oops. Sorry, just gotta wait for that to reboot. Oops. Okay. So I'm just taking some actual black. The reason I'm using black as opposed to this color that I mixed is they are slightly different. Is the black is to be as expected darker, more more black than the black that I can make by mixing the colors on the palette. Which shouldn't be surprising, um, but since I'm going to use my black Posca pen to do uh, the outlining, that is also going to be really, really dark. So I want it, this uh, this black to kind of fit in quite nicely. It's interesting. I see like a little bit of. There's a little gap there in certain places, huh? I'm just gonna do one big solid circle, but re again, remember that his painting is huge, so he can kind of get away with lots of nuance. Just checking my wrist and palm to make sure I haven't been just stamping colors all over the canvas as I've been doing this. Sometimes you take your hand off and you realize, oh, there's paint everywhere. How on earth did that happen? So, I'm pretty happy with the center circle, but it's a little bit lopsided, so I'm going to slowly expand on the right hand side outward. Eyeballing painting a circle is a little bit tricky. Whoa. So now we're losing the shape and I just have to keep on going. I 
think that's pretty good. <laughs> we'll see. Um, you know, it looks a little bit like I got black paint in there, but it's actually the darker part of the purple that is kind of closing in on the top, which is, you know, a little bit of a bummer, but what are you going to do, right? Okay. So I think I'm, I'm pretty confident that I've got enough there for uh, to use with the Posca pen. Pascal, so that's probably the vinyl disc there. It does sort of look like a record, doesn't it? Yeah, and Carol says, yeah, a vinyl record goes with the musical notes, does it not? Yes. Very much. Although I think this is probably, what, 1923 this was painted? I don't know when the first record was. That's an interesting question. I'm sure that's a, a very easy thing to Google, but... Before you Google it, what do you think the answer is? When did the first record appear? I would say 19... Were there records before World War One or World War Two? I don't... I'd say maybe 1944 would be my guess as to when the record first appeared. And there's Jean is going to say, hello, 1923, Pascal says. Wow, interesting. I didn't think it was that earlier. Hi, Jean. Um, okay, so I'm going to paint this red, and then I'm going to do the black outlines here. Actually, I want to make sure that's dry before I go too far here. You know, now that that black circle is there, it does look like that red is a little bit lopsided. I do just think, can I get away with it just a little bit more? Since I've got a bit of this glazing fluid before it's all dried up.
not sure I like what I'm up to here. So let's see if I can wipe some of this away. And there we go. That's the benefit of using glazing fluid is if you're not happy with it, you can just wipe it away. So I think I can, I'll, I'll come back to that area. I think I do, ah, I think we're good. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna use my Posca pen to start doing all the line work on here. That's gonna save a lot of time. You can hear the Posca pen when I shake it, there's a little cartridge inside that helps mix that paint up. Good idea is to give it a good shake and then let's see, do I have a piece of scrap? Right, imagine trying to paint a mark like that. That would drive you absolutely bonkers. The one thing with the Posca pen is I find it takes like overnight until it's dry. So uh, two things, you wanna make sure that this is dry before you use the Posca pen on top of it. Otherwise, it's gonna ruin the tip. But also, if you plan on doing any extra painting over top of it, you gotta be careful that it makes sure it's really, really, really dry. Like it seems to me, like I have tried to glaze over top of a Posca pen after I've let it dry and blow dried it. And it, it almost like it, it came back to life, like the zombie paint. <laughs> So you just want to kind of, I think at this stage, say to yourself, is this about as good as it's going to get for right now before I blow dry? And so I'm just going to do one more quick blow dry over this just to help making sure it's all. Oops, I just realized I'm muted. Okay, my apologies. <laughs> so uh, I was talking about different kinds of rulers and the reason why I'm using this ruler is there's a little bit of a gap underneath so that that way the paint, like if I was to use a ruler like this to try, this ruler is touching the surface. I, now I can kind of flip it upside down and I've also, it's beveled so there's a little bit of a gap there. But this one's, the metal one's a little bit higher, so that's why I'm going to use it. The one thing that, that I just have to watch out for is if I was to put this down right now, is the Posca pens 
take a while to dry. So you just really want to make sure this is really nice and dry before you start making lines all over. Um, Pascal says, if we are to use a Posca pen, can we consider t taking a fountain pen and use acrylic paint? You could try, I mean, I just want to make sure that people know what material I'm using here. So that's what this Posca pen looks like. All right, it's, uh, it's got this very small tip, you know, it's 0 0.07 millimeters. That's, this, that's my fingernail right there. So as about as sharp as you can get. The Posca pen though, I've noticed, and again, I can't remember how, what I was talking about before I muted the, before I was on mute, but um, I find that like, it's like a, you really, you basically have to let it dry overnight. Like if you try to make lines with the Posca pen, let it dry, you blow dry it, and then you think it's it's set, and then you get some wet paint next to it, it seems to kind of like reactivate it. Bring, it's like a zombie. It'll come back to life and haunt you. <laughs> so you just have to be careful. So there might be a few lines that I do and then have to do some serious blow drying on there to, to make sure it's as solidified as possible. Tricky, very tricky. So, what I'm gonna I want to try to do is do all the the hmm, big lines, the line, and especially lines that I can see very clearly. So I want to go pretty close down here, all the way to the tip of that triangle. Now you can see that, you know, my, my line, it's going to be, Sorry, you know my big head's in the way right now. Ay ay ay. Okay. So there's a big gap there. which is undesired. <laughs> uh, I gotta think about it while I'm doing more lines here. I probably should have painted the outside, been pointing the other way so I could really see how that lined up. paint this red circle here and blow dry a few things.
almost put my uh, paintbrush into my tea. <clears throat> Okay, so let's blow dry this here. Okay, so it does look like these, they're, they're dry. Dry enough, I think. Again, they might be dry to the touch, but if we were to get some wet paint, like I think I'm gonna try to fix this here. So in fact, let's just see. If I try to fix this, I'm gonna get a little bit of glazing fluid. It's not, this is not a, an outrageous problem right I mean there's worse issues in the world than this but you know this is probably something that's gonna happen to a few people so let's just see okay so I can see the the Posca pen I can see the ink kind of mixing with this paint very a little bit in the edge there so I just having to be mindful of that so if anything what I could do is to try to almost bring a little bit of that into the paint here to smudge it into this area That's why I'm, dr I'm going with the, the line as opposed to going away from the line because otherwise I'm afraid I'll get to uh, I'll pull that black out in there. I think that's pretty good. I mean, I'm actually surprised at how well I was able to, to deal with that edge being a little bit off but you know Pascal says Kandinsky's lines are not always exactly on the edge sometimes colors goes behind the lines um, and we can see that in the circle up there for sure in fact let's I want to do the outlining of this circle just to sharpen it up And then let's do the outlining of the red circle. Yikes, that was some sloppy work here, Michael. Whoa. Okay. 
think it might have been this. Got a little bit of red on the tip there. Did I not blow dry? Oh, I didn't. <laughs> Paint is still wet there. Okay, so let's continue doing some line work on here. Okay, I gotta blow dry, I think, before I start putting rulers and stuff on here. So let's just do that. muted again um first of all this pen got a little gummed up so i just wiped off all the excess you can even dip it into a little bit of water if you absolutely need to to help clean it up but now all these lines it's just a little confusing to me so i'm going to outline things that i can see that i don't need a ruler to do that are smaller shapes like these triangles and circles and then that will clarify for me where the bigger lines go. Because right now it's like kind of hard to see them. You kind of have to almost uh, visualize all of this. And my, you know, I don't have that big of a brain, so. These circles are going to be a little bit wonky, right? There are templates that you can get that um, you can use to trace circles and triangles and squares, and those are great, but I, I'm sure I have some somewhere here in the massive material behind me. Just so people can, if they're ref 
referring to the original. I have something to see. You know, I have a pretty steady hand, and this is even, it's pretty tricky for me to do all of these geometric shapes. So, if when you do this you find it a little tricky, then, hey, we're kindred spirits, right? Wow, that is one wonky. You know, as always, just do the best you can. I mean, it's not like it's a competition or there's an award ceremony at the end. Like, I would just see all anything we're doing as sort of practice for doing your own painting. And this is a great, you know learning activity if you're using these pens for the first time or you know to get used to learning these pens and doing something um, uh, that you know one might say that the stakes here are much lower than if you're working on your own painting Ravi says can I use a black sharpie you can use a black sharpie would I recommend it no because a black sharpie is is uh it's it's not an art material it's not intended to last for more than maybe a few days at most right if you put black sharpie on this and you put your painting anywhere near a window within 48 hours you're going to notice that the black lines have gone either purple or green they're going to fade they could even bleed out into the rest of the painting which could make you feel very angry and upset. So I would strongly recommend against using a black Sharpie, but you know, if you're, if you just wanna, if you're, just wanna finish the painting quickly and you're just, uh, this is not, you know, a, a major concern for you is to, to getting it perfect, which I don't think it should be anyway, but Then you could use it. I mean, when I have done workshops and schools with kids, we use we'll paint with watercolor, and then we'll finish with a black sharpie because it's easy for kids to use. It results in in pretty good artwork, and kids can take it home, hang it on the fridge. Boom! Everyone's happy probably is not expecting to last for 50 years as long as it uh, makes it home I think everyone's happy you know some parents are quite happy to, to get rid of their children's artwork sooner than later which I think is a bit sad but you know who am I to tell people how to parent their kids
you know, in some way, like this is what I say all the time, like in, you using the the templates can be a bit of a become a quite the crutch, and in this is sort of an instance where. I almost wish I hand drew a little bit of this because then I wouldn't be so worried about getting the lines in the right place. So I'd just be like, ah, well, as long as they're there, it's, it's fine. Um, I wish I had a much smaller ruler like this. I got another one of these black Posca pens. They only cost like maybe five bucks at the art supply store, and they are super helpful. Oh, I do. I got another one. Oh, this is a brush, I think. I think one side's brush. Hmm. Anyway, uh, let's keep on going here. I'm going to try to get all this relatively this done very quick here. It's like it's wiping some of the ink off as I use it. There we go. So the way that I'm just approaching this is I'm just kind of circling all the way around, trying to allow things to dry as long as possible. And then eventually I'm going to have to use the blow dryer to come in here and uh, help set things. I 
Also because of the way I got my studio lights in here. I got lights kind of going in many different directions, which is or the, I've got shadows in different directions, I mean. But it does, like, once some of these lines start appearing, it definitely makes things much easier. Just let that sit and dry. It's those first few lines and being able to get them in the right place that is tricky. Ravi says, thanks, Michael, for answering the question. I can't wait to run to the store tomorrow and get some Bosca pens. I have white acrylic pens that I used when we did the Hilma F. Clint painting last year. <laughs> um, and Kandinsky and Hilma were both competitor in abstract painting during that time. Uh, anyways, now I'm jobless. <laughs> did they put you out of work? <laughs> Kandinsky... Uh, and Hilma F. Clint put you out of, of work. Okay, let's see. I might want to just blow dry things here soon. Just, yeah, let's just do that right now. So there was a there's a little gap of the blue missing, but cons and there's a little bit on the other side here. But I think those are so minor that it doesn't bother me too much.
So I just made a couple little dots on either side. They're very small. That way I can see where a line should begin and end. Same sort of thing. Let's go here and connect to the tip of that other line. tiny little dots Ravi says, uh, I can't proceed um, to the next step, so signing out, and I'll catch up later. Thank you, Michael, for these for these live painting sessions. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, Ravi. John says, should I just ignore the missing horizon? Um, not sure what you mean, John, right? Because this is a totally abstract painting, so technically there is no horizon in here. Um, uh, so I'm not sure where you... S uh, wh why would you need a horizon anyway, I guess, is my question. Um, not sure. So let me know if, if you want in the chat. Zoom out and just take a look side by side. Yeah, still a bunch of lines to go, but now that I've sort of starting to kind of plot out all of the the big shapes, the, those big lines, you know, once I get a few more of these in here, all of a sudden it's going to really come together much quicker because I don't have to do quite such kind of mental kind of hoops jumping around in here. Okay. 
Okay, I think I probably need to blow dry that again. this area right in here so I think I want to put a corner right about there and somewhere over here almost right up to that big triangle dry let's come let's go to work on another place to let all that slowly dry see uh, Pascal says wondering how do we know what tool is okay to use in a painting can we use a compass is there a way to know what tools the originals used I, I 
probably would imagine that he used a compass for this. I don't know how he did those lines. I mean, again, we're talking those lines which on the screen look small, like my painting. You know, we're talking about a painting that's a, a you know, about as wide as, you know, the, the, the width of this painting is about as wide as my arms can stretch, right? And it's about that, you know, it's taller than you can see on the screen here. It's a gigantic painting, so if he was doing it with a paintbrush and just very carefully painting it, it might up close look really sloppy, kind of like mine, but from as soon as you stand a couple feet away from it, it looks crisp and clean, which is why artists often paint larger because, yes, we it's nice to see those paintings in person, but we live in a world now where all of our images exist on in books magazines online and so very rare is like the majority of times when we see artwork we're, we're not actually seeing it in person right so um artists are often more concerned about what it looks like i mean obviously they they want it to look great in person but if it looks great in a magazine that's also you know really really helpful <laughs> um Um, so Carol says, I'm starting to see images such as metronome and piano and, and keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> Gail says, thanks, Michael. Interesting artist. I got to finish it up tomorrow. Jean. Hi, Jean. Uh, says, hi, still not searching the band, still searching the truth and the better. I just stopped watching a beautiful video about an artist and seen a cool blue in a moment of open mind about our discussion. Okay. I, just, I did see, Jean, you posted a comment what, since we've been talking on something else. I just got a notification saying that, that magenta is not a cool color. So, uh, I, I haven't read your entire comment yet, but uh, I look forward to to your your reasoning behind that. Maybe if you want to explain how you arrived at uh, that um, I'd be very interested to know because it sounds like an interesting discovery that you've made it certainly conflicts with what scientists have been telling us for hundreds of years Okay, I don't know what you're you're talking about, John. The cool blue is a purple blue, not a green blue. Sorry, but I tried, but I can't. Cool blue can be in both directions. It's a confusing designation. While we could simply say green blue or purple blue, we do see green blue or purple blue for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what uh, the disagreement is here, but uh, I can explain it. But I let you first read the second message about the cool blue. I think you're getting you're hung up on on words, the words that we use for painting, and I can understand why it's confusing. The reason why it's confusing is every brand uses different names for their paint. So even though we can you and I can say 
we can we can use a word like ultramarine blue different companies will mix different kinds of ultramarine blue and some won't even call it ultramarine blue they might call it like deep sea blue or um, uh, or jean blue or I mean so it gets really confusing that's why in one of my videos I, I showed all the colors from different brands and then and the different tubes of paint that I would buy for Windsor and Newton, for Amsterdam paint, Liquitex, Golden, every single one of them has different names for their paint. So I get that it's confusing for you, but um, I think once if you follow those rules, you, you buy those tubes of paint, then we can just refer to them as warm and cool blue, and because whatever name you're using, if I because if I just start using the, uh, if I just start saying cyan, some people don't have a tube of a cool blue that is called cyan. Some people have a cool blue that is called cerulean blue or phthalo blue, right? So if I said cyan blue, people would be like, well, well I, which, which one is the cyan blue? I don't have a cyan blue. But if I say cool blue, like, oh, okay, I've picked, I've bought this color that matches up with my cool blue. So again, you if you, you certainly don't have to watch these videos um, if you don't want. Sandra says, don't feed the trolls. Um, I, I guess it's just, you know, when I say that there's people who disagree with what I'm saying or have watched one video or read a book and they get upset, you know, it's like you can you can see that there's, um, that it's not like I'm just making it up, right? This is my YouTube channel tends to get like maybe 10 or 20 comments like this every day and you just go like okay well I don't I don't know uh, you, anyone is welcome to believe whatever they want to believe I think you know if you've been painting with me for a while you you can just see quite clearly on your own how things work Right? I mean, the evidence is there, as far as I'm concerned. See, I might need to blow dry things soon here.
Pascal makes a grip great point. It's not just one cool blue, it's coolness. It's like temperature, literally. There are degrees of coolness and warmth. The cool blue is not just one color. Great point. Yes, absolutely. There's some cool colors that are colder than others and warmer than others. Um, yeah, so exactly. Like, we're just choosing one... Like, what I've tried to do is choose colors that are... Um, you know, the warm and cool blues are in relation to one another, right? Because there's there's literally probably a hundred million cool blues and probably a hundred million coo warm blues, right? But I'm trying to choose two that are about as far away as possible before the cool blue becomes a green and before the warm blue becomes a purple. That way, if we want to bridge the gap, we can always mix our warm and cool blues together. But they're also going to make really nice saturated mixes when we mix them with yellow and, and red and so forth, right? Um, great point, Pascal. You know, I think at the end of the day, every artist has to sort of find their own way. And, you know, if people find me helpful for a while and then they go like, yeah, you know what? I kind of figured my own system and I'm going to do that. And that guy's no longer helpful. Then, then that makes me happy that somebody would graduate to their own system and style, right? You don't want to be a student forever. I mean, I, know, I have some friends that are perpetual students that have been in school since high school. They're doing, they finish college and then they go to graduate school and then they go to get a PhD and then they decide to do another PhD in something else. And some people love being in school. Um, I kind of, you know, I like being in school. I like learning, but I also at some point kind of want to just do my own thing and kind of try to apply all the knowledge that I've learned and um, So other questions here. Did Kandinsky have a Posca pen? Probably not right. Did he just have a super brush control? Uh, so, yeah. Kandinsky definitely did not have a Posca pen. I, mean, I don't know how long these have existed for. I bet you maybe 10 years, maybe? I don't remember seeing these when I was younger. Um, you can get, like, um, pens that you can put your own ink in. Uh, the, the trouble with acrylics is that acrylic, you know, it tends to be thicker. So having, so being able to get it so it can come out of a pen is kind of tricky. So they've clearly sort of been working on trying to find the right mixture. Now we've got fluid acrylics, acryl, like ink acry or acrylic inks th that have do a really good job. And those are, I mean, again, acrylics have only existed for since like the 1950s. Right, became commercially available in like the early 60s, so it's not like they've been around for a long time. So there's still there's still innovation with art materials, right? It's you know art materials have been developing over since we were painting on caves, right? Um, so how did he he again? He, I, I keep saying this painting 
the painting that he the original painting was wider than this this is the size of this painting this is how big the original is so you could probably fit about 30 of these 9 by 12 size canvases in the large painting so even though this looks really great his his painting looks really really great on this small screen up close it's not quite as refined as it might actually appear um Jean says, I just try to point out that saying cool blue is confusing for you and many others. It's the green direction because it's a convention, nothing else, not instinctive, so complication. So what would be your, what, what, what do you say, Jean, would be an easier, less confusing way to talk about color? Right? I'd be, I'd, I would love to know how you would do this in a way that is even simpler than my method, right? There's thousands of people that have, I've been teaching with this method that, um, it's, that feel like it is really, really helpful. So if you've got a way that is simpler and easier, more instinctive, as you say, than mine, then that's great. Then you should, I, I've saw on your channel, you've just got one video of a video game, like, you should be teaching people this system that you have figured out and using the language that you have discovered that is easier than mine. Um, Tony says, why does this feel like splitting hairs over semantics? Yes, Pascal, cool blue that I have seen a cool blue that was nearly purple, but if I describe it to you by calling it cool blue to reproduce it, you'll go in the opposite direction considering cool blue. A, there's no way that a cool blue can look purple. That's a, that's a warm blue. So you're getting confused. That's not a warm blue. Or it's not, it's not a cool blue. That, yes, cool blue is moving towards green warm blue is not moving towards green warm blue is moving towards magenta like i i don't know what to say i think you're like you've gotten yourself completely confused over things and people are trying to help you in the chat and i think it's just it's it's not I don't, I don't know what to say. You're just, you've got, you're, I think this is very straightforward. I've, ne I've spent my whole life teaching art and learning art. And this is the system that makes most sense to me. And so I would love to see the system that you've come up with. I know you wrote on an earlier post that you're going to start your own paint company. So that sounds really exciting and interesting. I would love to to see the colors you come up with and the names you come up with for them. And again, just like every other brand of paint, you're going to be probably naming your own colors, the names that you want to give them. And that would be really cool. So what what would, what names are you going to name all of these different colors that you're that we've got billions of different colors. You got your work cut out for you, Sean. Okay, Jean, uh,
it's just dude you're you're hijacking my live stream again and it's just so like this is these are not conversations that are, are worth having if you want to have this conversation like offline or something we can you, you can send me a message we can do that but we're i want to be focusing on this artist and what we're painting so um I think unfortunately that's going to be the end of our conversation with you this afternoon so it's just uh, very distracting okay so let's get back to this painting it's after 45 minutes of that um, i want to get this painting done and have dinner with my family oh, god okay My apologies, everyone, for uh, having to um, try to sort through some of those messages. But again, you can see, you can see that uh, I'm not—I don't make this stuff up when I tell you that there's people who will who who, who just refuse who, who refuse to accept any of this and want to push you know a completely different c concept of color and painting and I also think, Jean, if you're still watching, the fact that you've mentioned that you keep getting banned by other YouTubers should be kind of a, a, um, a sign that maybe your approach is not working. I remember the first time you posted a message saying, I can't believe I'm, you know, I'm not, I haven't been banned yet. It's like, oh, really? That's, <laughs> you know, it's like walking into a party and saying like, how come I haven't been kicked out yet? <laughs> and Vera was like, I don't know. Should we kick you out? Um... And, you know, it's, I find it so fascinating. It's the same sort of thing with, like, uh, science today and people doubting scientists and, um, you know, I can imagine how frustrating it would be to be 
a scientist and arguing with people who say that uh, climate change isn't real or vaccines don't work or so on and so forth. It's just sort of... <laughs> it's like I've been doing this my whole life and... Um, you don't have to take my word for it. In this case, it's not going to kill you if you don't listen to me, but I think it will make your life a lot easier if you do. Okay, so I'm just going to blow dry this again. <laughs> Sandra says the movie Don't Look Up with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence is all about that uh, yeah my wife and I just started watching that movie on Netflix I think it's on Netflix like la last week or whenever it came out and I had to stop I we got maybe 45 minutes and I was like this is really stressing me out <laughs> like how you know, because the whole movie is just about how you have these, you know, famous scientists who are just can't find anybody to 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 believe that there's an asteroid on its way within that's going to destroy the Earth in a few months, and um, everyone, no one wants to listen. <laughs> just hit a little too close to home. Uh. See, we'll widen that line. Just move ooh, the ruler down to get a slightly wider line. Slowly getting there. Lots of these little... got probably about another 10 minutes on here to finish up. And 
and I'm just going to be going maybe a little bit faster with some of these smaller details in there in here. I think it's like, you know, we can take a little bit more liberty of how we paint them. Pascal says, an interesting, scary movie. Sanders says, it certainly doesn't end well. Tony says, I might want to watch that yet. Maybe that'll be my Friday night date with my cats. <laughs> yeah, maybe you'll... I, I, it's, it's supposed to be a bit of a comedy. Um, don't Look Up is... Tiny little lines crisscrossing around everywhere here, isn't there? I think I'm gonna blow dry this again because I can't remember where what I've done, what I haven't done yet. Pascal says, my Kandinsky is horrible next to this version. There are probably rules of thumb to know when the minimum size of a painting to use when reproducing large paintings. We'll call it a quick experiment draft. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, there's, you know, some, t some of these paintings, they appear relatively straightforward when we're, when we're looking at them on a computer screen. And then you gotta like do all these little details and everything kind of grinds to a halt. Um, again, it's also just like how closely do you want to reproduce the the painting, right? Like it doesn't have to be perfect and you don't have to have all the lines in here. I mean, I'm kind of interested in in getting as close as possible, so that's why I'm kind of taking a little bit extra time to do it, but... Uh, I know it's probably a little bit confusing for people, but that makes it much easier for me. Oh, 
Okay, maybe I'm because there's some there's some more. You know, let's blow dry. Actually, I'm gonna blow dry this, and then. Whoa. Uh, I do want to just finish that off. I'm so close to being done. All those lines. Interesting, Pascal says, ooh, like I could have tried an impression of an abstract painting. It's an interesting kind of idea there. Um, much closer got some little triangles in here you know one thing it is slowing me down is that I can't see I've lost some of the the the, the line work in here so I'm not exactly sure where some of these lines are I'm just making them up. Okay, I think, do I have all my line? Oops, I got a couple more. Okay, so I'm going to come around and start painting some of my black in a few places. Because I, I need that. In fact, let me zoom in. Let's. Let's go right here. All right, you can see it's, it's a little bit. Uh, quite as clean and pretty as maybe I would like it to be.
but you know when it's zoomed out it looks much better and you know one of the things I always tell people is that you'll never no one will ever look at your painting as carefully as as you do I mean maybe they will at some point and we and I think as an artist that should be the goal to, to do something that will inspire people to look closely but especially you know if you're just beginning you know not getting hung up on making it perfect because I know that the paintings that I made when I was just starting like I might have felt really really proud about them at the time you know and I remember you know some people wanting to buy them and I was like no 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 someday this painting is gonna make me rich I'm gonna be I'll sell this for a billion dollars one day and then then later you're like why did why did I hold on to this thing because now I'm so much better than I was and uh, You know, I see little places where I'm like, oh, definitely I've missed a few colors here and there. So I'll tackle those here in a few moments. I think this is supposed to be green in here. I'm just going to paint it black. As the Rolling Stones said. Right? I see a green compass and I'm going to paint it black <laughs> okay how about let's zoom back out and just see how some of those new improvements impacted things Thank you. 
you know, he's definitely got a bit much more of like a speckled kind of quality in the backgrounds there that I don't have. Um, it doesn't really bother me too much. Like mine probably actually in, in my way, even though mine's maybe a little bit sloppier up close, I feel like mine looks maybe a little bit cleaner in some way. <laughs> and you guys are talking about seeing little images in the painting. That is pretty funny. Um, so I'm gonna let's just I'm gonna start speeding here, taking much more liberties with my colors and my color mixing. Uh, let's get a bit of white. this color even though I'm gonna put just more yellow on it just really quickly really you know this kind of you know speeding around at the very end is like I always say all the accidents happen at the end when you're close to home and you can see the end in sight and you start kind of taking some liberties so it is kind of dangerous but it seemed like it's like what is really at stake like if everything should go completely wrong I mean what is I mean it's just a painting, right? And this is coming from somebody who's... This is my life. But, you know, like... I think if the, le the less you take it seriously, the more fun you can have. At least when we're doing this type of activity. You know, when I'm making my own paintings, I'm, I'm definitely take it quite seriously, maybe even too seriously, which is maybe one of the reasons why I like doing this, is it kind of gives me a bit of a, a break from having to overthink things and... I kind of like some of these colors that I'm putting in there that are quote unquote not the right color, but um, let's do like a bit of an orange. Now, where was this orange supposed to go? Oh, I think it was going to go in here. This is going to, supposed to be a bit more of a brown, but... I 
Again, I just have to be, I can see this uh, paint kind of uh, mixing a little bit with my Posca pen, so just always being kind of mindful of painting with the line and painting as opposed to just sort of painting over it. Or, or away from it, which will kind of drag that color. into the shape. Get a bit more red on there, get some white in here. You know, I've, I'm kind of get going, getting maybe more and more, giving myself more and more permission here to, to be a little bit loose with these colors as I'm getting close to the end here and I still have more work than anticipated to do. And that's actually, it's kind of fun. Like, yeah, it's like, oh, it's not close to the original, but it's like, oh, but I'm kind of enjoying it more. And that should be the, the point anyway. And really the main composition, the structures in place, is it possible that if Kandinsky rose from the grave, he would, or he's rolling in the grave right now because some of the colors I've painted are more intense than he intended? I don't know. I don't know if he would find that upsetting or not. I think he would be pretty accepting. I think he would be just happy that someone is um, talking about some of his ideas and um, that he's still relevant a hundred years uh, after making these paintings. Right? That's that's about as much as an artist can ask for, right? One thing I like about the original, and I don't, I just can't do it because the details are just so tiny, but there's almost like little colors around every shape and kind of these little glowing, um, like just slight, like everything seems to be sort of glowing around all these edges. And that's really, really cool. Obviously I can't do all of that. painting the scale Uh, 
There's a few more lines and things missing grazed. I want to try to get a quick gray in here. Pascal says, uh, I might need a dry mop brush with a tint of gray to add a layer of cloud-like gray everywhere, although not necessary. Um, you could just sort of, it's it's almost not even like it's, like he's, there, it's, I, I mean, I've seen this painting in person like 20 years ago, so I can't quite remember, but it almost looks like maybe like a sponge that he's gone around here now to if you were to use a sponge on this i think it probably would would not look very good because it's so small but on a much larger surface that type of maybe it probably wasn't a sponge it was probably like just a rag and kind of just dabbing and wiping away of paint like i can i can sort of imagine that there have been a lot of experimentation involved here and playing with the paint and Oh, I want to wrap up ASAP here. Okay, come on. What else do I need to do? What else do I need to do? A little bit of this gray green. You know, it's funny just thinking about uh, this is some of the interaction that we had earlier in the episode. I remember decades ago I was doing, uh, I was painting in public as part of a residency in Los Angeles in a town called uh, Pasadena, which is just north of, of downtown LA. And... I would set up my easel every day. This is when I was trying to make abstract paintings. And I thought it would be kind of funny just to make abstract paintings in public. Because people would come up and they'd be like, what is it that you're painting? I don't... <laughs> and 
there were people that that came up and were like heckling me you know that were you know so often people that had a little bit to drink and uh, I tell you after after you've got had people heckling you while you're making a painting it sort of makes everything else uh, every other interaction you just sort of like eh. <laughs> I mean it's just <laughs> all you could do is just kind of laugh right okay I think that's probably enough I mean I could go in and continue working but even if I did want to do more what I'd probably want to do is let things dry a little bit before especially if I want to do any um, which we call it uh, glazing maybe on top of any lines that I have here because I run the real risk of having things smudge and becoming a bit of a disaster so it doesn't hurt just to let things dry so I'm just taking a last little bit of of white as I get to my final marks here I painted these earlier with a very thin transparent white but now I just feel like it's not quite dark enough Ah, I forgot to do this little area. I think there's, you know, I could do just a few little things in this area, and then I will wrap up. All right, so I'll just do our finishing touches here. And then we're going to wrap up. So, um, you know, if you found today's episode helpful and interesting and useful, <laughs> please consider liking, subscri subscribing to the channel, hit the notification bell, commenting on the videos even after looking at previous videos, sharing your artwork to the Facebook group, as well as on your own Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or uh, what else is there? Instagram. <laughs> TikTok, wherever you want to put it, and pointing back to this channel would be awesome. And also, if you want to support the channel with a small donation, it's greatly appreciated. That's how I buy all the materials, and that's how I can afford to spend all the time putting these episodes together and the research. So I'd be very appreciative of, of that. So I'm just going to do the finishing touches on the painting now. And then we will wrap up. What was I going to do? Oh, I want to do... Like little dots in here. Is that too controlled? He's got all these. feel like I don't want them to look at too messy looking. Ah, nice. 
see an orange. See this thing just continues to go on forever if you if you let it. That's Okay, I do have to um, move on here. So let's just look at this here. We're going to do our side-by-side -side comparison. Okay, not bad. I mean, again, there's there's little things. Maybe I could darken in a few places, but for all intents and purposes, we're there. Wow, four and a half hours. I didn't realize that was that long. Uh, okay, so I feel pretty good about that. I got pretty darn close. Okay, so. Thank you everyone for painting along with me for, um, this has been one of the longer episodes and you'd be surprised considering some people would say this is something children could do. Obviously it takes a little bit of effort that maybe most children aren't capable of doing. Um, next week on Tuesday, we're going back to our Beginner Tuesdays. We're going to be looking at the work of Sonia Delaunay. We're going to be doing an abstract painting of hers, but this one is not nearly as rigid as this one. It's much more like free-flowing. There is a template on the, the Dropbox. I've already done the drawn the template out, and it's we're going to be just practicing the basic mixing of paint it's something that everyone can do very very basic so if you're like whoa this one was too complex don't worry on tuesday we're going to go back to the well nice and simple and be nice and inclusive for even the most beginner painter thank you everyone enjoy the rest of your evening have a great weekend and we'll see you guys in uh on just a few more days it seems like they'll catch up to us pretty quickly i hope, I hope you have a great evening and we'll talk to you all very soon. Good night, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.